Newsroom will, of course, be watching uh, the updates on, on that game uh, when after kickoff coming up uh, in a short while. It's time for the France Fanquet debate. While Europe braves banking crises, soaring unemployment and recession, down in Durban, they are kicking off a party this Tuesday and toasting the fifth summit of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, a club that's banking on growth of nearly 7% this year. The star of the show, China's new president, Xi Jinping, whose country boasts an economy larger than that of all the other BRICS uh, combined. Already he's pledged $20 billion in loans to Africa and pledged to build a multi-billion dollar port and industrial zone in Tanzania, which was the first stop of his tour of Africa on Monday. What are the terms of condi and conditions? Critics call it a one-sided partnership with China plundering Africa's resources. Critics who've included the president of mineral-rich Zambia in the past. But there are those Africans who welcome the arrival of Chinese investment. And just as Germany now has to confront the political and economic pitfalls of dwarfing its European partners, can China nurture its relationship with Africa and, and also with its BRIC partners. Today in the France Van Gette debate, we're looking at China and Africa. With us, Solange guyot She uh, is, is with uh, CERI, the uh, uh, research center for uh, the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Also with us, Senegalese uh, political scientist, Adam Aguet, author of uh, the uh, uh, China, Africa, the Dragon and the Ostrich. Welcome back to the debate. And welcome to economist, Alexandre Kateb, who is the author in French of The New World Economies, How the BRICS Change the World. Welcome as well, the France Van Get debate, where you can always join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter, our hashtag is F24Debate. Now, Xi Jinping's first foreign visit as president of China was to Moscow last Friday. His first summit is in Africa. Um, let me begin with you, Solange guyot What does that say about the new man in charge? Um, I'm not sure if it says something specifically about the man, but certainly about the country that he's representing. And there's a clear shift in the center of gravity of economic, political, diplomatic gravity that's moving perhaps from traditional areas in the West to new areas of potential development, such as Eastern Europe and Russia and continents like Africa. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the trip uh, to Africa, drawing, uh, she drawing praise uh, from his hosts ahead of the opening of that summit in Durban. We view China's success as a source of hope and inspiration as we engage with the task of finding our own solutions for bringing about a better future. The rise of China, therefore, has lessons for us all as we seek to emulate your example. Uh, others, though, not so enamored, the boss of one South African glassmaking company, uh, complaining in the Wall Street Journal that manufacturers need economies of scale. We don't have that. China uses that to do what they want to do. They're the gorilla in bricks, and we're the runts. Adam Agay, do you agree with that statement, that uh, it's, uh, it's a one-sided relationship? I don't think uh, it makes sense to see this relationship uh, in a unilateral way, because uh, as much as China... Uh, is very clear in her drive to make sure that it secures her national interests, getting the resources in Africa and making sure that geopolitically it uh, has uh, food in Africa. On the other hand, uh, at this very moment when Africa is looking for investors and partners that can help uh, the continent get uh, financial support for building infrastructure and others, indeed, China can appear as a good partner from which, as Jacob Zuma rightly said, you can learn something because China has been able to lift out of poverty 600 million people and it has been able to build the infrastructure and create somehow this second world most powerful economy in terms of parity, purchasing power, a PPP, 
and probably going to even uh, outpace the United States by the year 2016. So you cannot just dismiss it uh, as a one-sided aspect. Uh, Alexandre Kateb, uh, to, to grow, you need money. Yes. Uh, the Chinese, do they have money that traditional banks in the West uh, don't have? Well, they, 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 they have a lot of, of cash aside. Huh? You know that uh, the Chinese have around $3.5 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. And most of these uh, uh, foreign exchange reserves are not used today. So uh, for them, it would be advisable to invest uh, a share of that uh, in other countries uh, in which they want to acquire some influence. Uh, and, Ch and Africa uh, is perceived now as the last uh, emerging uh, frontier um, of globalization. It will be uh, the, the, the future success story of globalization in the next uh, 30 to 40 years. And uh, China and the other BRICS uh, want to have uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their share of this growing African pie, uh, even uh, beside the, 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 the commodities and natural resources debate. All right, so uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, beginning with a trip, uh, by the way, uh, to Tanzania, where he pledged, again, $20 billion in loans over three years uh, to the continent. $20 billion. W how does that work exactly? When, when, when the president of China makes a statement saying we're going to pledge $20 billion to Africa, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that they will they will uh, make twenty billion dollars of loans to Africa. Most of them are, are, are loans, are not like uh, good gifts. terms. Uh, yes, on concessional uh, terms uh, um, and uh, um, on uh, without any uh, like uh, uh, conditions, uh, without any conditions attached to the use of this means, uh, uh, contrary to what the the ADB, the World Bank, uh, uh, the IMF uh, uh, used to do when they pledged some resources to. These countries, I think, what African countries uh, like uh, is the kind of uh, unconditional uh, uh, loans that uh, uh, Chinese uh, put at their disposal. Even though uh, there is also this uh, natural resource bargain, uh, where on one side we we give you access to financing to infrastructure, on the other side you give us access to long long term uh, supply in natural resources. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the great bargain between uh, China and uh, and Africa, so to say, and this. Still relevant now. Uh, Adam Agay, is that the way it works? Yes, China has learned this resource back loan from the uh, years of uh, opening up in the 1970s uh, from, China, from Japan because China uh, exchanged its oil then that it used to produce in exchange of Japan's financing. And that's what it is doing in Africa. On the other hand, what China is doing is mitigating her own risk. Instead of always exposing herself to financial risk with the United States, it makes sense for China to come into Africa and take risk in a continent where you have natural resources. So it's not doing it uh, out of... But it can uh, be a risky investment as well if you not go at to... All. Not at all. Really? Did, did you see, for instance, there was a coup this week in the Central African Republic? Uh, there... It's, it's, your money is not always safe uh, in, in countries that have weak infrastructure and sometimes fragile political systems. You know, China, they have learned the lessons of capitalism. They know high risk yield high returns. And that's why where the Western nations have been hesitating in going into some uh, frontier market, difficult market, China has been good at doing that in Sudan, in uh, DRC, in other places. So they know that that's how they can capture the resources. And there is another aspect to this China. There is a continuum in the strategy. You notice that they started off with a visit to the Soviet the Russia because they want somehow to counterbalance America's strategic move in embracing India. So by going through Russia, they can build a counterweight to America's uh, geostrategic approach in world affairs. On the other hand, by coming to Africa, they are showing that they are going through Tanzania, which has been one of the signature places where they did the first big project, the Tanzania-Zambia railway in the 1970s. So there is a continuation. They know what they are doing. And by taking this kind of risk, when they mention $20 billion, it seems very impressive. But by the way, it's a peanuts. That's not big money. The African continent needs almost $100 billion yes. per year. But the Chinese, by doing it, and they one are fifth of it is quite a lot. But it I, looks I good, but it's supporting the Chinese businesses into making the inroads into Africa. So strategically, China knows what it is doing. 
All right, the, the, uh, uh, the pledge, $20 billion over three years. It was another pledge, though, uh, made by China's president on Monday when he was in Tanzania. This one was a political pledge. With growth in our economic strength, China will continue to offer, as always, necessary assistance to Africa with no political strings attached. No political strings attached. That's music to the ear of many an African head of state. Yeah, yes, I think it is. Um, and the onus, um, I think, is very much on the host governments, those who are engaging with China and negotiating with China uh, on their own terms. He did mention no political strings attached, but he didn't mention anything about economic strings attached. And I think that is quite important to mention because they're not uh, condition-free loans entirely. So there are uh, generally some mm -hmm. econo economic commitments to be made, some sort of compromise, so that generally Chinese companies can uh, benefit from these loans, and that helps them to set up their operations in Africa. That said, I think part of the reason, or one of the main reasons for China's economic takeoff is also the restructuring of modes of production, and where they've embraced a much more horizontal form of um, production where they can integrate a multinational network of providers and suppliers. So when a Chinese contract, uh, let's say, obtains a deal to build a hydro dam or a railway, they're not only working with Chinese subcontractors. Everybody along the production chain will benefit. And I think along that chain, you, are, you have a lot of local companies as well who are using it as a learning curve and who are using it also as a way to interact more with Chinese companies, be they private or public. All right. As somebody uh, um, who, who, who agrees with that take, that the, the Chinese are inclusive and engaging, is um, the uh, Zambian economist uh, 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 who uh, is uh, Dambisa Moyo, author of the bestseller Dead Aid, Why Aid is Not uh, Working for Africa, um, in an interview with China Daily uh, entitled More China, Less Bono is the Prescription. Mm -hmm. She says China has a per capita income lower than at least 20 countries in Africa, yet you'll never see aid appeals or images of poverty that are attached to Africa. The Chinese and also the Indians doggedly object to being portrayed in this manner. There is a whole lot of dignity that uh, goes with that. Um, this, uh, this sort of mantra of trade, not aid, uh, has uh, sometimes been bantied about sort of in a philosophical manner. But how do people, like in your native Senegal, feel about that? I think it is not debated thoroughly in places like Senegal and across many African countries. There is, unfortunately, as Dambiza Moyo rightly said, this uh, culture of uh, expectation of uh, aid. You know, like uh, Dambiza and uh, William Esterly of uh, New York University have argued, uh, almost over $700 billion of foreign aid. Yet we know that the outcome of aid has been dismal. It's not something that has yielded results. So uh, thinking about trade, attracting foreign direct investment, making sure that the, there is a, a climate of investment that is very useful. In this regard, somehow African leaders are learning some lessons. If you look at back in the past, 20, 30 years ago, African leaders, when they went to the African Union, they were proud in displaying their military medals like the Idi Amin and others. These days, when African leaders, they go to events, they show their growth rate, uh, they show that how they are positioned in their country in terms of doing good business. Now, uh, in the face of China, I think you have to be careful not to go too much too far, because the Chinese, even in the way they formulate their message, they don't uh, express everything they think. When they say, for instance, we don't uh, link uh, anything with our aid, that's not accurate. If you don't follow the one China policy, mm -hmm. if you do business with Taiwan, the Chinese want to do business with you. So to a certain extent, we have to be careful in the message. We need to create the conditions so that Africa becomes attractive for foreign direct investment. And that is the case. You have a growing uh, number of uh, uh, consumers in Africa. You have a div democratic dividend, demographic dividend. You have natural resources being discovered more and more in Africa. And that's why whether China, Brazil, and others, and also Western countries are interested in coming back to Africa. And unfortunately, they are forgetting the necessity to respect certain norms of democracy. And China is 
paving the way, unfortunately, in this regard. Uh, uh, you were mentioning uh, uh, countries that re uh, recognize Taiwan and, and not China. Senegal was one of them where that switched over. And it used to be an astute game that uh, a lot of African states would play, where they would once in a while switch uh, from recognizing one to the other. Uh, countries uh, c come to mind like that. But now I think there's only four countries in Africa <coughs> that recognize Taiwan. Yes, I think the main um, issue to remember here is China's interest in Africa originally initiated from a domestic program of national consolidation, in particular the Communist Party being recognized as China at the UN Security Council. So up until 1971, the, Taiwan held the permanent seat on that council. So what you had was uh, a, a race that took place for international recognition on a continent that was undergoing a similar struggle for international recognition. And I think that is definitely an ideological card that the PRC played with struggling um, colonized regions such as Zambia, such as Tanzania. And I think that political message of solidarity has carried through. As Adam was saying, there is some sort of continuity, and, and there was, and if, if there was a big amount of symbolism, was there not? The fact that uh, going to Tanzania, there was that railway link that was built in the nineteen okay. seventies between Zambia and Tanzania, and it was sort of one of the first big projects. Yes, I think up, even up until the 1990s, it was really sort of the emblem or the symbol of China's engagement on the African continent. Um, it was very much uh, a basis of, or an alliance that was an ideological one, a political one, and. What we have seen is um, the basis of that cooperation shift and change the one that's based on economic cooperation. <clears throat> but again, framed in very similar terms, win-win cooperation, mutual benefit. And the idea is, I think, to share this experience together of becoming a modern nation. China is gradually becoming a common nation, a, a modern nation in its own perceived way. And I think this is very important to restate, is what is China's domestic agenda? And I think once we understand um, the, the, the huge economic transitions and political transition and moral trans social and moral transitions that are taking place in China today, we understand more clearly how China is operating outside its own borders. It's influencing in pro its foreign policy, but it's also influencing entirely separate, non-political migration patterns. And I think this is something that we have to well, also mention. What do you mention. mean by non-political migration patterns? It's a, it, we have to make we have to disaggregate the government to government relations with the people-to-people -people relations, quite simply. And what you have nowadays in Africa, when people state numbers and they say there's a million Chinese people living across the African continent, perhaps there are. But these are not soldiers sent over by the Chinese government. And here is a very common misconception that we hear about in the press very regularly. And these are the people who are actually representing China politically abroad, whereas they're actually ordinary men and women who are looking who are ready to endure hardship in order to have a better life. And in that sense, there's nothing really very different to these Chinese migrating to Africa who resemble the thousands of Africans that migrate to China every year for the same purposes. Right, They're going gonna... to China for better opportunities, for access to education, to try and fight for a better life. And that is nothing, not something that is very specifically Chinese. All right, and it's a point that we'll pick up on when we come back. You're watching the False Van Get Debate.